Hello, Brazil. This is Aaron Beam from the rock band Red Fang of USA. You're listening to 89FM, The Radio Rock. Fala, galera. Beleza? Eu sou o Endo Corrêa e hoje eu vou conversar com o Aaron Beam, o baixista e vocalista da banda Red Fang. Lançaram um álbum novo chamado Aaron's. É sobre isso a principal pauta que eu vou conversar com ele hoje, além de várias outras coisas. Brasil, cerveja que eles lançaram também. E tudo isso com exclusividade para 89 a Rádio Rock. Hey, Aaron. How are Hello. you? Hello. I'm excellent. How are you? You definitely have a uh, radio voice that sounds very soothing and, and sonorous. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the <laughs> uh, nice background and you're using it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, well, it's, I'm in my bedroom. I'm in my Portland apartment. And uh, one of the things that so I was working a uh, work from home job over lockdown. And one of my pet peeves is seeing people's beds in the background of their Zoom meetings. <laughs> so I blurred out my background. That is nice, man. And how are things in Portland? Uh, they're pretty good. Um, we actually are, we're having another little heat wave right now. Uh, and as of tomorrow, the mask, they're doing mask mandates again, just because this Delta thing is, you know, starting to look pretty stupid. So, uh, but yeah, we just did, um, we got together last night, the band did to do a, a uh, live stream uh, on in dot live that was super fun. We did a couple of question and answers. We actually answered a question from a woman from uh, Sao Paulo about the show that we played in Inferno Club in 2012. And what do you remember from Brazil? Uh, well, I the number one thing is that that show that we played in Inferno Club in 2012 because that's one of our that's one of my top time top all-time favorite shows uh it was completely nuts the crowd was so awesome and just everything about it was amazing um i actually do maybe this is means that i'm like not doing it right but i actually do remember caipirinhas yeah. and cachaça <laughs> i still have like this much cachaça left from a bottle that uh, uh i think it was hoboto was the name of the band that we played with in um i can't remember which town it was but I just, I love Brazil. I would love to, to come back sometime soon. Yeah, it's a nice club. It changed the names a lot since you played there, Inferno yeah. Club. It's not Inferno Club anymore. It's another name, but it's still yeah. there. I hope still there after this pandemic time. Yeah, yeah, me too. And talking about the new album, Arrows, how was the process of writing and recording it? Uh, it was, it was fun. I mean, it was, we, we gave ourselves a lot more, um, We're just a lot more relaxed about the, the approach to it. Uh, um, we sort of just by circumstance ended up having a lot more time to write. Uh, we only toured for, I think, about a week in 2019, um, partly because I got married that year. And then we also did it in, in town at a studio that is uh, a real fancy studio that a friend of ours, Chris Funk, um, sort of manages. And so we had a lot of leeway to kind of go in and out of the studio and, and you know, spend a couple days here and then a couple days next week. And so if we recorded something and then listened back and had an idea about how we wanted to change it, we could just go back and do that. So it was just a lot more... Um, just a lot more open and relaxed, I guess. It was, it felt good. It felt like the way I would like to do it every time. <laughs> and it was done on December, 2019, but just released in June of this year because of the pandemic time. Did you change anything on the songs? No, we had actually already, uh, the like vinyl was already pressed and everything was already completely mm -hmm. manufactured and done, I think by March of 2020. And which was, good in a way because it meant that uh I, i'm sure you've heard that um vinyl factories are like huge backlog it's really hard to get anything done yeah. and so ours was already done and so we just we're just kind of waiting for the sweet spot of when can we actually release this so that we can tour and talking as you say about the vinyls when, when i first hear the album i i listened to it on spotify hmm. and when i was hearing i noticed the first track was take it back it's a short song And then came up don't, during the album Interrupt Mud. There is also a short song. And I oh. say, oh, that is definitely side B. I didn't know it was side B on the vinyl. Was that something oh, yeah. you did on purpose? Uh, that's a weird, um, 
I mean, we sequenced it like that for the vinyl on purpose, for sure. I mean, that's strange that it would play out of order on Spotify. That's kind of annoying. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we just wanted to have like little kind of breaks or, you know, like little kind of introductions to just sound or whatever before the songs really kicked in on both sides. Originally, the kind of original idea that it was Chris Funk's idea was to take take it back and cut it in half and play the second half at the beginning of the record and then the first half at the end of the record. So it was kind of like weird, you know, a fade out at the beginning and then a fade in to the, that song at the end, but we just, the timing didn't work. I don't know if I say it right, but on the, on Spotify is it's on the sequence. Oh, okay. 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 It's what, when, but I didn't know you had two parts, you know? Oh, <laughs> I, I see. I see. I say, oh, it's definitely side B. It's beginning. Oh, now I get it. Yeah. Yeah. That it was, that it was very clear <laughs> that that was the, the, uh, the <laughs> distinction, the delineation. No, I really like when you to listen to the full album. I'm not a big fan of playlist and this kind of thing or listening on shuffle mode. Right. I don't like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. What did you do during the pandemic? You got married? How was get married? <laughs> get married and start a pandemic? Uh, well, it was before the, it was 2019. I got married. We got married in um, August of 2019. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, for us up here, what we were worried about was fires because there's been so many fires up in this area. Uh, for the past several years, just because of droughts. Um, but my wedding was awesome. It was at a lake not far from our house. And uh, yeah, uh, everybody came, everybody from the band came. Um, and then we actually went to the band, went and did a short little tour in Indonesia uh, a week after that. So it was, it was a very nice time. And it was, no one had even heard of uh, COVID-19 at that point. Did you write new songs during this time? Uh, no, mostly we, we had most of our songs already written um, sort of by, I think we started the recording process in September of 2019. So almost everything was already done at that point. Is that true that drums were recorded in a pool? For a few of the songs, yes. The songs where there was kind of like bigger kind of booming drums where the, like it's slow, the slower songs really, because if it's too fast, then it just becomes... Uh, it sounds like chaos and noise, but yeah, uh, uh, Unreal Estate and I think Y and maybe Fonzie Scheme. I think those three had pool drums on some or all. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. And talk, talking about the singles, Arrows, why did you choose as the first single and also the album title? Um, well, we decided that, you know, most bands like to name albums after songs from some other record. And so we decided to break with tradition and set a new trend of naming an album after a song on the same record that it's on. Uh, that's actually kind of normal to do. It's just, we had never done it, but um, uh, I guess I'm not really sure. I mean, it just felt sort of like the most in the writing process that felt like it was the most sort of cohesive um fully realized song before we even went into the studio. So I think we kind of just were kind of thinking it as the single before we even went and recorded. And after recording, maybe we would have picked something different, but uh, uh, our director, Whitey, was already working on a video for that one. So would you it have picked the... a different song? No, I picked it to Iris. It's my favorite one. Favorite yeah. one. And I really enjoyed the first track, Take It Back. It's a beautiful, neutral song for an album. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. The the bass line in your voice you are really good on the on the song. Talking about the video of Arrows, I have to talk to you too about it. And I know you've been talking a lot on the interviews. Oh, sure. But how how was shooting with a Katana Sword? Uh it was scary, maybe more scary than driving through stuff with a car. But uh <laughs> uh it was super fun. I just like I guess I really um demonstrated my complete lack of any athletic ability whatsoever it was way harder to get the swing right and like slice through stuff i mean it was very very sharp it was easy to slice through stuff with it too easy probably uh but um yeah uh about it was as fun as you could as you would imagine and did you really spend all the budget on the sword <laughs> i think most of it actually yes it was they're not cheap <laughs> And you, uh, the guy who is killed on the end of the video is your tour manager? Yeah, Chris Coyle. 
Yep. Was that some kind of message to him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch out. <laughs> And also on other great videos, you also have great videos. Red Fang videos is also fun. Why it's the lion name as Ari Von Party? Is that right? Uh, Arnie Von Party. Yeah. Addicted uh, on pizza. Yes, exactly. He was a pizza addict. Uh, that was that's uh, a director, writer, director that we more recently started working with. His name is Ansel Wallenfang. Uh, that's his actual name. So he felt it sort of like fate that a wallen fang would work with red fang um but yeah he's done that video plus he did that video game video for the song antidote and then uh we've got another one that's i think it's in edit right now it's almost done for rabbits and hives that he did that i think will be pretty entertaining more of exactly. more comedy <laughs> that's what we hope from your videos <laughs> yeah uh, Dave Gross said one time, we, music we did, it's a professional thing, but videos, we have fun. Is that the same idea Red Fang has? That is a, yeah, that basically encapsulates exactly uh, our attitude as well. So I think he probably must have stolen that from us. <laughs> and talking about riffs, Red Fang got a lot of riffs. riffs. How is the process of creating riffs? Well, Brian is really just like a riff factory. He, uh, he probably could come up with a new riff every single day. Um, for me, it's like, I, I think I, I uh, overthink my riffs too much. So I'm more like a riff a week kind of guy, but it's really just, if I sit down and just pick up the bass and just start, you know, like put some videos on the TV so I can kind of turn off half my brain and just, just see what comes out. That's sort of the way that it works best for me. Uh, and then we, you know, we come into practice with some ideas that we've already sort of worked on a little bit at home first, and then we play them all together and they start to evolve and turn into something that um, has all of our uh, flavor added to it. And what do you feel more comfortable, singing or playing bass? Uh, playing bass. Yeah. You, st you started playing the piano when you were 80. Is that right? Yes. I was the weird kid that actually requested piano lessons from my parents. Uh, so, yeah, I started on piano and then I moved to saxophone. Um, and then when we moved when I was 12 and we couldn't afford to move the piano and we didn't buy a new one. So then I was sax and guitar after that. Um, started playing guitar, I think, when I was 15. And how many instruments did you play? Uh, just, I mean... Uh, zero. No. <laughs> I fake it on bass. Uh, no. Yeah, I, you, you know, bass and guitar, I can kind of play. I can play saxophone a little bit. Uh, I can play piano, like, pretty poorly. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, I could fake it on some other instruments. And I read, I was reading some comments about the new album. And uh, the, the main comments that I said up front, a lot of people said, when I hear the new Red Fangs album, I know rock and roll is alive. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, I mean, that's like kind of, a, that's a pretty big responsibility. Like, I don't really, I just do what feels natural to me. And it's great if people connect to it in some way and, you know, it makes them, I, I, I guess that it, it means that the thing that inspires me to do the music that we do in Red Fang in the first place is coming across because it's really just about our love of this form of music. And so, you know, it, we res we love and respect a bunch of different bands of all kinds of different styles within the sort of like general rock uh, umbrella. And so, um, yeah, maybe people are hearing like whatever their favorite band is, we have some little tiny piece of that. And so, I think that that's, uh, yeah, that's very flattering. And there's a tour coming up in USA. What can you expect and what do you expect from the fans and the audience? Uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be a mix of being really excited. Uh, so I think a lot of people are going to be probably going to shows for the first time. Maybe not by October. Maybe by then they'll have gotten used to it. But I think it's still going to be a combination of kind of like, being excited, but not really being totally sure about how to act, you know, and like what's actually safe or what's, you know, what's normal anymore. So 
uh, but the energy I think will be there, but I think there'll be like, I'm guessing just having gone to a couple shows already, there'll be a little like hint of like, are we really allowed to do this? <laughs> you know? You know what, you, you tour a lot with Red Fang. What do you most mi miss about touring? What you don't miss, but you have to do? <laughs> uh, well, I think what I don't miss is, um, well, I'll put it the other way. What I really um, valued a lot about uh, being forced to stay home is that I got much, much more time with my wife and my son than I ever have in my whole life and, or in his whole life uh, in my whole time um, being with my wife because we started, we got together, you know, in, the, in 2014 uh, in the midst of like our busiest uh, touring um, uh, lifestyle or whatever you want to call it. So that sort of like the main thing that I miss is that I'll miss is just the quality time that I get with my loved ones in uh, back home. But uh, man, I mean, it's, it's pretty rough. Like when just so much of your, like what you, your soul needs to survive is that sort of like life performance thing. And you just can't do it. It's, it's pretty rough. Yeah. And Red Fang also have a beer now. Any chance you sell it in Brazil too? <laughs> I would love to. I should I actually just picked some up from the um, brewery just this morning. Um, yeah, it's like a, it's pretty powerful. It's a malt liquor, but it's a subtler malt liquor that um, has like a little bit of hops from these friends of ours in New Zealand. Uh, so it's a little bit different. It's a little bit subtler and, and more drinkable than a regular malt liquor. I don't know if you have malt liquor in Brazil at all. It's like a kind of sweeter, maybe a little bit sweeter and stronger um, beer than normal. I enjoy beer, but I don't know the names. I'm terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> Name the, the beers that I really yeah. enjoy. It's whichever one is in front of me. That's the right one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. My friend especially say, oh, drink this one. Okay, I drink it. If you're yep. saying it's good, it's good. <laughs> right, right. I like it. And you formed a red, red thing when you were in the middle 30s. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I, um, I think I was... Jeez, I guess I must have been like 35, 36, somewhere in that range, maybe a little bit, maybe 34. Uh, and yeah, it was the um, kind of a strange time to start a band, I guess. But um, all four of us who were in the band, we all were mutual admirers of each other's bands from um, years gone by and just happened to all be without... We, we just got to a point where all four of us had no other band at all. And so it was like, Hey, maybe we should start playing together. Uh, and we just, it just happened that we were old men already. And now we're even older. And how much these experience from of previous band uh, helped to Red Fang succeed? Um, I think that it helped tremendously because they were all models for what we didn't want to do anymore. Cause all, all of our old bands were kind of more like, uh, just, more complicated than they needed to be and it was like a lot of let's just have this riff happen for four seconds and then go to the next riff and then go to the next riff just because our brains were we were impatient and it just seemed like too boring to play the same riff six times in a row uh, but then we realized that it's not just about you know we've played those songs a thousand times before we play them in front of people and so to us, it's like, oh yeah, I already know this riff because I've heard it a thousand times, but you have never heard it. So uh, maybe we should play it six times instead of one time. Yeah, I'm telling you, you are inspiring me to start a new band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. We also have a radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> in the morning, this early. <laughs> Thanks so much. It was a pleasure talking with you. Hope to see you in Brazil again soon. Yes, me too. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Big part, Simon. All right. 89 A Rádio Rock